Chapter Four of Moods by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Moods by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Four Through Flood and Field and Fire. Very early were they afloat again, and as they glided up the stream, Sylvia watched the earth's awakening, seeing in it what her own should be. The sun was not yet visible above the hills, but the sky was ready for his coming, with the soft flush of color dawn gives only to her royal lover. Birds were chanting matins, as if all the jubilance of their short lives must be poured out at once. Flowers stirred and brightened, like children after sleep. A balmy wind came whispering from the wood, bringing the aroma of pines, the cool breath of damp nooks, the healthful kiss that leaves a glow behind. Light mist floated down the river like departing visions that had haunted it by night, and every ripple breaking on the shore seemed to sing a musical, Good morrow, Sylvia could not conceal the weariness her long vigil left behind, and after betraying herself by a drowsy lurch that nearly took her overboard, she made herself comfortable and slept till the grating of the keel on a pebbly shore woke her to find a new harbor reached under the lee of a cliff, whose deep shadow was very grateful after the glare of noon upon the water. "'How do you intend to dispose of yourself this afternoon, Adam?' asked Mark, when dinner was over and his sister busy feeding the birds. "'In this way,' answered Warwick, producing a book and settling himself in a commodious cranny of the rock. "'Moore and I want to climb the cliff and sketch the view, but it is too rough a road for Sylvia. Would you mind mounting guard for an hour or two? Read away, and leave her to amuse herself. Only, pray, don't let her get into any mischief.' by way of enjoying her liberty, for she fears nothing, and is fond of experiments. "'I'll do my best,' replied Warwick, with an air of resignation. Having slung the hammock and seen Sylvia safely into it, the climbers departed, leaving her to enjoy the luxury of motion. For half an hour she swung idly, looking up into the green pavilion overhead, where many insect families were busy with their small joys and cares, or out over the still landscape, basking in the warmth of a cloudless afternoon. Then she opened a book Mark had brought for his own amusement, and began to read as intently as her companion, who leaned against the boulder slowly turning his pages, with leafy shadows flickering over his uncovered head and touching it with alternate sun and shade. The book proved interesting, and Sylvia was rapidly skimming into the heart of the story when an unguarded motion caused her swing to slope perilously to one side, and in saving herself she lost her book. This produced a predicament, for being helped into a hammock and getting out alone are two very different things. She eyed the distance from her nest to the ground, and fancied it had been made unusually great to keep her stationary. She held fast with one hand, and stretched downward with the other, but the book insolently flirted its leaves just out of reach. She took a survey of Warwick. He had not perceived her plight, and she felt an unwanted reluctance to call for help, because he did not look like one used to come and go at a woman's bidding. After several fruitless essays, she decided to hazard an ungraceful descent, and, gathering herself up, was about to launch boldly out when Warwick cried, Stop! in a tone that nearly produced the catastrophe he wished to avert. Sylvia subsided, and coming up, he lifted the book, glanced at the title, then keenly at the reader. Do you like this? so far very much. Are you allowed to read what you choose? Yes, sir. That is Mark's choice, however. I brought no book. I advise you to skim it into the river. It is not a book for you. 
Sylvia caught a glimpse of the one he had been reading himself, and impelled by a sudden impulse to see what would come of it, she answered with a look as keen as his own, "'You disapprove of my book. Would you recommend yours?' "'In this case, yes, for in one you will find much falsehood in purple and fine linen, in the other some truth in fig leaves. Take your choice.' He offered both, but Sylvia took refuge in civility. "'I thank you. I'll have neither. But if you will, please steady the hammock. I will try to find some more harmless amusement for myself.' He obeyed with one of the humorous expressions which often passed over his face. Sylvia descended as gracefully as circumstances permitted, and went roving up and down the cliffs. Warwick resumed his seat, and the barbaric yawp, but seemed to find truth in demi-toilet less interesting than youth in a grey gown and round hat, for which his taste is to be commended. The girl had a small scope for amusement, and when she had gathered moss for pillows, laid out a white fungus to dry for a future pincushion, harvested penny royal in little sheaves tied with grass blades, watched a battle between black ants and red, and learned the landscape by heart, she was at the end of her resources, and leaning on a stone surveyed the earth and sky with a somewhat despondent air. You would like something to do, I think. Yes, sir, for being rather new to this sort of life, I have not yet learned how to dispose of my time. I see that, and having deprived you of one employment, will try to replace it with another. Warwick rose, and going to the single birch that glimmered among the pines like a delicate spirit of the wood, he presently returned with strips of silvery bark. You were wishing for baskets to hold your spoils yesterday. Shall we make some now? he asked. How stupid in me not to think of that. Yes, thank you, I should like it very much. And producing her housewife, Sylvia fell to work with a brightening face. Warwick sat a little below her on the rock, shaping his basket in perfect silence. This did not suit Sylvia, for feeling lively and loquacious, she wanted conversation to occupy her thoughts as pleasantly as the birch rolls were occupying her hands, and there sat a person who, she was sure, could do it perfectly if he chose. She reconnoitred with covert glances, made sundry overtures, and sent out envoys in the shape of scissors, needles, and thread. But no answering glance met hers, her remarks received the briefest replies, and her offers of assistance were declined with an absent, no thank you. Then she grew indignant at this seeming neglect, and thought, as she sat frowning over her work behind his back, he treats me like a child. Very well, then, I'll behave like one, and beset him with questions till he is driven to speak. For he can talk, he ought to talk, he shall talk. "'Mr. Warwick, do you like children?' she began with a determined aspect. "'Better than men or women.' "'Do you enjoy amusing them?' "'Exceedingly, when in the humour.' "'Are you in the humour now?' "'Yes, I think so. "'Then why don't you amuse me?' "'Because you are not a child. "'I fancied you thought me one. "'If I had, I probably should have put you on my knee and told you fairy tales, or cut dolls for you out of this bark, instead of sitting respectfully silent and making a basket for your stores. There was a curious smile about Warwick's mouth as he spoke, and Sylvia was rather abashed by her first exploit. But there was a pleasure in the daring, and choosing another topic, she tried again. Mark was telling me last night about the great college you had chosen. I thought it must be a very original and interesting way to educate oneself, and wanted very much to know what you had been studying lately. May I ask you now? Men and women, was the brief answer. Have you got your lesson, sir? A part of it, very thoroughly, I believe. Would you think me rude if I asked which part? The latter. 
"'And what conclusions do you arrive at concerning this branch of the subject?' asked Sylvia, smiling and interested. "'That it is both dangerous and unsatisfactory.' He spoke so gravely, looked so stern, that Sylvia obeyed a warning instinct and sat silent till she had completed a canoe-shaped basket, the useful size of which produced a sudden longing to fill it. Her eye had already spied a knoll across the river, covered with vines, and so suggestive of berries that she now found it impossible to resist the desire for an exploring trip in that direction. The boat was too large for her to manage alone, but an enterprising spirit had taken possession of her, and having made one voyage of discovery with small success, she resolved to try again, hoping a second in another direction might prove fruitful. "'Is your basket done, sir?' she asked. "'Yes. Will you have it?' "'Why, you have made it as an Indian would, using grass instead of thread.' It is much more complete than mine, for the green stitches ornament the white bark, but the black ones disfigure it. I should know a man made your basket, and a woman mine. Because one is ugly and strong, and the other graceful but unable to stand alone? asked Warwick, rising with a gesture that sent the silvery shreds flying away on the wind. One holds as much as the other, however, and I fancy the woman would fill her soonest if she had the wherewithal to do it. Do you know there are berries on that hillside opposite? I see vines, but consider fruit doubtful, for boys and birds are thicker than blackberries. I've a firm conviction that they have left some for us, and as Mark says you like frankness, I think I shall venture to ask you to row me over there and help me fill the baskets on the other side. Sylvia looked up at him with a merry mixture of doubt and daring in her face, and offered him his hat. "'Very good, I will,' said Warwick, leading the way to the boat with an alacrity which proved how much pleasanter to him was action than repose. There was no dry landing-place just opposite, and as he rode higher, Adam fixed his eyes on Sylvia with a look peculiar to himself a gaze more keen than soft, and seemed to search one through and through with its rapid discernment. He saw a face of contradictions, youthful, maidenly, and intelligent, yet touched with the unconscious melancholy which is born of disappointment and desire. The mouth was sweet and tender as a woman's should be, the brow spirited and thoughtful, but the eyes were by turns eager, absent, or sad, and there was much pride in the carriage of the small head, with its hair of wavy gold gathered into a green snood, whence little tendrils kept breaking loose to dance upon her forehead, or hang about her neck. A most significant, but not a beautiful face, because of its want of harmony. The dark eyes, among the fair surroundings, disturbed the sight as a discord in music jars upon the ear. Even when the lips smiled, the sombre shadow of black lashes seemed to fill them with a gloom that was never wholly lost. The voice, too, which should have been a girlish treble, was full and low as a matured woman's, with now and then a silvery ring to it, as if another and a blither creature spoke. Sylvia could not be offended by the grave penetration of this glance, though an uncomfortable consciousness that she was being analyzed and tested made her meet it with a look intended to be dignified, but which was also somewhat defiant, and more than one smile passed over Warwick's countenance as he watched her. The moment the boat glided with a soft swish among the rushes that fringed the shore, she sprang up the bank, and leaving a basket behind her by way of hint, hurried to the sandy knoll, where, to her great satisfaction, she found the vines heavy with berries. As Warwick joined her, she held up a shining cluster, saying with a touch of exultation in her voice, "'My faith is rewarded. Taste and believe.' 
he accepted them with a nod and said pleasantly as my prophecy has failed let us see if yours will be fulfilled i accept the challenge and down upon her knees went sylvia among the vines regardless of stains rents or wounded hands warwick strolled away to leave her claim free and silence fell between them for one was too busy with thorns the other with thoughts to break the summer stillness sylvia worked with as much energy as if a silver cup were to be the reward of success the sun shone fervently and the wind was cut off by the hill drops gathered on her forehead and her cheeks glowed but she only pushed off her hat thrust back her hair and moved on to a richer spot vines caught at her by sleeve and skirt as if to dishearten the determined plunderer but on she went with a wrench and a rip an impatient ah and a hasty glance at damaged fabrics and fingers lively crickets flew up in swarms about her surly wasps disputed her right to the fruit and drunken bees blundered against her as they met zigzagging homeward much the worse for blackberry wine she never heeded any of them though at another time she would have gladly made friends with them all but found compensation for her discomforts in the busy twitter of sand swallows perched on the mullein tops the soft flight of yellow butterflies and the rapidity with which the little canoe received its freight of ethiop sweets as the last handful went in she sprung up crying done with a suddenness that broke up the long parliament and sent its members skimming away as if a second null had appeared among them done came back warwick's answer like a deep echo from below and hurrying down to meet him she displayed her success saying archly i am glad we both won though to be perfectly candid i think mine is decidedly the fullest but as she swung up her birch pannier the handle broke and down went the basket berries and all into the long grass rustling at her feet warwick could not restrain a laugh at the blank dismay that fell upon the exultation of sylvia's face and for a moment she was both piqued and petulant hot tired disappointed and hardest of all laughed at it was one of those times that try girls souls but she was too old to cry too proud to complain too well bred to resent so the little gust passed over unseen she thought and joining in the merriment she said as she knelt down beside the wreck this is a practical illustration of the old proverb and i deserve it for my boasting next time i'll try to combine strength and beauty in my work to wise people character is betrayed by trifles warwick stopped laughing and something about the girlish figure in the grass regathering with wounded hands the little harvest lately lost seemed to touch him his face softened suddenly as he collected several broad leaves spread them out on the grass and sitting down by sylvia looked under her hat brim with a glance of mingled penitence and friendliness now young philosopher pile up your berries in that green platter while i repair the basket bear this in mind when you work in bark make your handle the way of the grain and choose a strip both smooth and broad then drawing out his knife he fell to work and while he tied green widths as if the task were father to the thought he told her something of a sojourn among the indians of whom he had learned much concerning their woodcraft arts and superstitions lengthening the legend till the little canoe was ready for another launch with her fancy full of war trails and wampum sylvia followed to the riverside and as they floated back dabbled her stained fingers in the water comforting their smart with its cool flow till they swept by the landing place when she asked wonderingly where are we going now have i been so troublesome that i must be taken home 
we are going to get a third course to follow the berries, unless you are afraid to trust yourself to me. Indeed, I'm not. Take me where you like, sir. Something in her frank tone, her confiding look, seemed to please Warwick. He sat a moment, looking into the brown depths of the water, and let the boat drift, with no sound but the musical drip of drops from the oars. You are going to hit a rock, sir. I did that three months ago. He spoke as if to himself, his face darkened, and he shook the hair off his forehead with an impatient gesture. A swift stroke averted the shock, and the boat shot down the stream, leaving a track of foam behind it as Warwick rode with the energy of one bent on outstripping some importunate remembrance or dogging care. Sylvia marveled greatly at the change which came upon him, but held fast with flying hair and lips apart to catch the spray, enjoying the breezy flight along a path tessellated with broad bars of blue and gold. The race ended as abruptly as it began, and Warwick seemed the winner, for when they touched the coast of a floating lily island, the cloud was gone. As he shipped his oars, he turned, saying, with very much the look and manner of a pleasant boy, "'You were asleep when we passed this morning, but I know you like lilies, so let us go a-fishing.' "'That I do!' cried Sylvia, capturing the great white flower with a clutch that nearly took her overboard. Warwick drew her back and did the gathering himself. "'Enough, sir, quite enough. Here are plenty to trim our table and ourselves with. Leave the rest for other voyagers who may come this way.' As Warwick offered her the dripping nosegay, he looked at the white hand scored with scarlet lines. Poor hand, let the lilies comfort it. You are a true woman, Miss Sylvia, for though your palm is purple, there's not a stain upon your lips, and you have neither worked nor suffered for yourself, it seems. I don't deserve that compliment, because I was only intent on outdoing you, if possible, so you are mistaken again, you see. Not entirely, I think. Some faces are so true an index of character that one cannot be mistaken. If you doubt this, look down into the river, and such an one will inevitably smile back at you. Pleased, yet somewhat abashed, Sylvia busied herself in knotting up the long brown stems and tinging her nose with yellow pollen as she inhaled the bitter-sweet breath of the lilies. But when Warwick turned to resume the oars, she said, let us float out as we floated in. It is so still and lovely here. I like to stay and enjoy it, for we may never see just such a scene again. He obeyed, and both sat silent, watching the meadows that lay green and low along the shore, feeding their eyes with the beauty of the landscape, till its peaceful spirit seemed to pass into their own, and lend a subtle charm to that hour, which henceforth was to stand apart, serene and happy, in their memories for ever. A still August day, with a shimmer in the air that veiled the distant hills with the mellow haze, no artist ever truly caught. Midsummer warmth and ripeness brooded in the verdure of field and forest. Wafts of fragrance went wandering by, from new-mown meadows and gardens full of bloom. All the sky wore its serenest blue, and up the river came frolic winds, ruffling the lily leaves until they showed their purple linings, sweeping shadowy ripples through the long grass, and lifting the locks from Sylvia's forehead with a grateful touch, as she sat softly swaying with the swaying of the boat. Slowly they drifted out into the current, slowly Warwick cleft the water with reluctant stroke, and slowly Sylvia's mind woke from its trance of dreamy delight, as with a gesture of assent, she said, Yes, I am ready now. That was a happy little moment, and I am glad to have lived it, for such times return to refresh me when many a more stirring one is quite forgotten. A moment after, she added, eagerly, 
as a new object of interest appeared. Mr. Warwick, I see smoke. I know there is a wood on fire. I want to see it. Please land again. He glanced over his shoulder at the black cloud trailing away before the wind, saw Sylvia's desire in her face, and silently complied. For being a keen student of character, he was willing to prolong an interview that gave him glimpses of a nature in which the woman and the child were curiously blended. I love fire, and that must be a grand one, if we could only see it well. This bank is not high enough. Let us go nearer and enjoy it, said Sylvia, finding that an orchard and a knoll or two intercepted the view of the burning wood. It is too far. Not at all. I am no helpless, fine lady. I can walk, run, and climb like any boy, so you need have no fears for me. I may never see such a sight again, and you know you'd go if you were alone. Please come, Mr. Warwick. I promised Mark to take care of you, and for the very reason that you love fire, I'd rather not take you into that furnace, lest you never come out again. Let us go back immediately. The decision of his tone ruffled Sylvia, and she turned willful at once, saying in a tone as decided as his own, No, I wish to see it. I am always allowed to do what I wish, so I shall go. With which mutinous remark she walked straight away towards the burning wood. Warwick looked after her, indulging a momentary desire to carry her back to the boat like a naughty child. But the resolute aspect of the figure going on before him convinced him that the attempt would be a failure, and with an amused expression he leisurely followed her. Sylvia had not walked five minutes before she was satisfied that it was too far, but having rebelled she would not own herself in the wrong, and being perverse insisted upon carrying her point though she walked all night. On she went over walls, under rails, across brooks, along the furrows of more than one ploughed field, and in among the rustling corn that turned its broad leaves to the sun, always in advance of her companion, who followed with exemplary submission, but also with a satirical smile, that spurred her on as no other demonstration could have done. Six o'clock sounded from the church behind the hill, Still the wood seemed to recede as she pursued. Still close behind her came the steady footfalls, with no sound of weariness in them, and still Sylvia kept on, till, breathless but successful, she reached the object of her search. Keeping to the windward of the smoke, she gained a rocky spot still warm and blackened by the late passage of the flames, and pausing there, forgot her own pranks in watching those which the fire played before her eyes. Many acres were burning. The air was full of the rush and roar of the victorious element, the crash of trees that fell before it, and the shouts of men who fought it unavailingly. Ah, isn't this grand? I wish Mark and Mr. Moore were here. Aren't you glad you came, sir? Sylvia glanced up at her companion, as he stood regarding the scene with the intent, alert expression one often sees in a fine hound when he scents danger in the air. But Warwick did not answer, for as she spoke, a long, sharp cry of human suffering rose above the tumult, terribly distinct and full of ominous suggestion. Someone was killed when that tree fell. Stay here till I come back and Adam strode away into the wood as if his place were where the peril lay. For ten minutes Sylvia waited, pale and anxious. Then her patience gave out, and saying to herself, I can go where he does, and women are always more helpful than men at such times, she followed in the direction whence came the fitful sound of voices. The ground was hot underneath her feet. Red eyes winked at her from the blackened sod, and fiery tongues darted up here and there, as if the flames were lurking still, ready for another outbreak. Intent upon her charitable errand, 
and excited by the novel scene, she pushed recklessly on, leaping charred logs, skirting still-burning stumps, and peering eagerly into the dun veil that wavered to and fro. The appearance of an impassable ditch obliged her to halt, and pausing to take breath, she became aware that she had lost her way. The echo of voices had ceased. A red glare was deepening in front, and clouds of smoke enveloped her in a stifling atmosphere. A sense of bewilderment crept over her. She knew not where she was, and after a rapid flight in what she believed was a safe direction had been cut short by the fall of a blazing tree before her, she stood still, taking counsel with herself. Darkness and danger seemed to encompass her. Fire flickered on every side, and suffocating vapor shrouded earth and sky. A bare rock suggested one hope of safety, and muffling her head in her skirt, she lay down faint and blind, with a dull pain in her temples, and a fear at her heart fast deepening into terror, as her breath grew painful and her head began to swim. This is the last of the pleasant voyage. Oh, why does no one think of me? As the regret rose, a cry of suffering and entreaty broke from her. She had not called for help till now, thinking herself too remote, her voice too feeble to overpower the din about her. But someone had thought of her, for as the cry left her lips, steps came crashing through the wood, a pair of strong arms caught her up, and before she could collect her scattered senses, she was set down beyond all danger on the green bank of a little pool. "'Well, Salamander, have you had fire enough?' asked Warwick, as he dashed a handful of water in her face with such energetic goodwill that it took her breath away. "'Yes, oh yes, and of water too. Please stop and let me get my breath.' gasped Sylvia, warding off a second baptism and staring dizzily about her. "'Why did you quit the place where I left you?' was the next question, somewhat sternly put. "'I wanted to know what happened.' "'So you walked into a bonfire to satisfy your curiosity, though you had been told to keep out of it. You'd never make a Casa Bianca. "'I hope not, for, of all silly children,' That boy was the silliest, and he deserved to be blown up for his want of common sense, cried the girl, petulantly. Obedience is an old-fashioned virtue, which you would do well to cultivate along with your common sense, young lady. Sylvia changed the subject, for Warwick stood regarding her with an irate expression that was somewhat alarming. Fanning herself with the wet hat, she asked abruptly, was the man hurt, sir? Yes. Very much? Yes. Can I not do something for him? He is very far from any house, and I have some experience in wounds. He is past all help, above all want now. Dead, Mr. Warwick? Quite dead. Sylvia sat down as suddenly as she had risen, and covered her face with a shiver, remembering that her own willfulness had tempted a like fate, and she, too, might have now been past help, above all want. Warwick went down to the pool to bathe his hot face and blackened hands. As he returned, Sylvia met him with a submissive, "'I will go back now, if you are ready, sir.' If the way had seemed long in coming, it was doubly so in returning." for neither pride nor perversity sustained her now, and every step cost an effort. I can rest in the boat, was her sustaining thought. Great, therefore, was her dismay when on reaching the river no boat was to be seen. Why, Mr. Warwick, where is it? A long way down the river by this time, probably. Believing that we landed only for a moment, I did not fasten it, and the tide has carried it away. But what shall we do? One of two things, spend the night here, or go round by the bridge. Is it far? Some three or four miles, I think. 
Is there no shorter way, no boat or carriage to be had? If you care to wait, I can look for our runaway, or get a wagon from the town. It is growing late, and you would be gone a long time, I suppose. Probably. Which had we better do? I should not venture to advise. Suit yourself. I will obey orders. If you were alone, what would you do? Swim across. Sylvia looked disturbed. Warwick impenetrable, the river wide, the road long, and the cliffs the most inaccessible of places. An impressive pause ensued. Then she said frankly, It is my own fault, and I'll take the consequences. I choose the bridge and leave you the river. If I don't appear till dawn, tell Mark I sent him a good night. And girding up her energies, she walked bravely off with much external composure and internal chagrin. As before, Warwick followed in silence. For a time she kept in advance, then allowed him to gain upon her, and presently fell behind, plodding doggedly on through thick and thin, vainly trying to conceal the hunger and fatigue that were fast robbing her of both strength and spirits. Adam watched her with a masculine sense of the justice of the retribution which his willful comrade had brought upon herself. But as he saw the elasticity leave her steps, the color fade from her cheeks, the resolute mouth relax, and the wistful eyes dim once or twice with tears of weariness and vexation, pity got the better of pique, and he relented. His steady tramp came to a halt, and stopping by a wayside spring, he pointed to a mossy stone, saying with no hint of superior powers, We are tired. Let us rest. Sylvia dropped down at once, and for a few minutes neither spoke, for the air was full of sounds more pertinent to the summer night than human voices. From the copse behind them came the coo of wood pigeons, from the grass at their feet the plaintive chirp of crickets. A busy breeze whispered through the willow, the little spring dripped musically from the rock, and across the meadows came the sweet chime of a bell. Twilight was creeping over forest, hill, and stream, and seemed to drop refreshment and repose upon all weariness of soul and body, more grateful to Sylvia than the welcome seat and leafy cup of water Warwick brought her from the spring. The appearance of a thirsty sparrow gave her thoughts a pleasant turn, for, sitting motionless, she watched the little creature trip down to the pool, drink and bathe, then fly to a willow spray, dress its feathers, dry its wings, and sit chirping softly as if it sang its evening hymn. Warwick saw her interest, and searching in his pocket, found the relics of a biscuit, strewed a few bits upon the ground before him, and began a low, sweet whistle, which rose gradually to a varied strain, alluring, spirited, and clear as any bird voice of the wood. Little Sparrow seized his twitter, listened with outstretched neck and eager eye, hopping restlessly from twig to twig, until he hung just over the musician's head, agitated with a small flutter of surprise, delight, and doubt. Gathering a crumb or two in his hand, Warwick held it toward the bird, while softer, sweeter, and more urgent rose the invitation, and nearer and nearer drew the winged guest, fascinated by the spell. Suddenly a belated blackbird lit upon the wall, surveyed the group, and burst into a jubilant song, that for a moment drowned his rival's notes. Then, as if claiming the reward, he fluttered to the grass, ate his fill, took a sip from the mossy basin by the way, and flew singing over the river, leaving a trail of music behind him. There was a dash and daring about this which fired little Sparrow with emulation. His last fear seemed conquered, and he flew confidingly to Warwick's palm, pecking the crumbs with grateful chirps and friendly glances from its quick, bright eye. 
it was a pretty picture for the girl to see the man an image of power in his hand the feathered atom that with unerring instinct divined and trusted the superior nature which had not yet lost its passport to the world of innocent delights that nature gives to those who love her best involuntarily sylvia clapped her hands and startled by the sudden sound little sparrow skimmed away thank you for the pleasantest sight i've seen for many a day how did you learn this gentle art mr warwick i was a solitary boy and found my only playmates in the woods and fields i learned their worth they saw my need and when i asked their friendship gave it freely now we should go you are very tired let me help you he held his hand to her and she put her own into it with a confidence as instinctive as the birds then hand in hand they crossed the bridge and struck into the wilderness again climbing slopes still warm and odorous passing through dells full of chilly damps along meadows spangled with fireflies and haunted by sonorous frogs over rocks crisp with pale mosses and between dark firs where shadows brooded and melancholy breezes rocked themselves to sleep speaking seldom yet feeling no consciousness of silence no sense of restraint for they no longer seemed like strangers to one another and this spontaneous friendliness lent an indefinable charm to the dusky walk warwick found satisfaction in the knowledge of her innocent faith in him the touch of the little hand he held the sight of the quiet figure at his side sylvia felt that it was pleasant to be the object of his care fancied that they would learn to know each other better in three days of this free life than in as many months at home and rejoiced over the discovery of unsuspected traits in him like the soft lining of the chestnut burr to which she had compared him more than once that afternoon so mutually and unconsciously yielding to the influence of the hour and the mood it brought them they walked through the twilight in that eloquent silence which often proves more persuasive than the most fluent speech the welcome blaze of their own fire gladdened them at length and when the last step was taken sylvia sat down with an inward conviction she could never get up again warwick told their mishap in the fewest possible words while mark in a spasm of brotherly solicitude goaded the fire to a roar that his sister's feet might be dried administered a cordial as a preventive against cold and prescribed her hammock the instant supper was done she went away with him but a moment after she came to warwick with a box of prue's ointment and a soft handkerchief stripped into bandages what now he asked i wish to dress your burns sir they will do well enough with a little water go you and rest mr warwick you know you ate your supper with your left hand and put both behind you when you saw me looking at them please let me make them easier they were burnt for me and i shall get no sleep till i have my way there was a curious mixture of command and entreaty in her manner and before their owner had time to refuse or comply the scorched hands were taken possession of the red blisters covered with a cool bandage and the frown of pain smoothed out of warwick's forehead by the prospect of relief as she tied the last knot sylvia glanced up with a look that mutely asked pardon for past waywardness and expressed gratitude for past help then as if her heart were set at rest she was gone before her patient could return his thanks she did not reappear mark went to scent a lad after the lost boat and the two friends were left alone warwick watching the blaze more watching him till with a nod toward a pair of diminutive boots that stood turning out their toes before the fire adam said the wearer of those defiant-looking articles is the most capricious piece of humanity it was ever my fortune to see 
you have no idea of the life she has led me since you left. I can imagine it. She is as freakish and wears as many shapes as Puck, a gnat, a will-o'-the-wisp, a sister of charity, a meek-faced child, and one does not know in which guise she pleases most. Hard the task of him who has and tries to hold her. Hard, yet happy, for a word will tame the high spirit, a look touch the warm heart, a kind act be repaid with one still kinder. She is a woman to be studied well, taught tenderly, and being one, cherished, with an affection that knows no shadow of a change. Moore spoke low, and on his face the firelight seemed to shed a ruddier glow than it had done before. Warwick eyed him keenly for a moment, then said, with his usual abruptness, "'Geoffrey, you should marry.' "'Set me the example by mortgaging your own heart, Adam.' "'I have.' "'I thought so. Tell me the romance.' It is the old story, a handsome woman, a foolish man, a few weeks of doubt, a few of happiness, then the two stand apart to view the leap before they take it, after that, peace or purgatory, as they choose well or ill. When is the probation over, Adam? In June, God willing. The hope of deliverance gave to Warwick's tone the fervor of desire, and led his friend to believe in the existence of a passion deep and strong as the heart he knew so well. No further confessions disturbed his satisfaction, for Warwick scorned complaint. Pity he would not receive. Sympathy was powerless to undo the past. Time alone would mend it, and to time he looked for help. He rose presently, as if bedward bound, but paused behind Moore, turned his face upward, and said, bending on it a look given to his friend alone, If my confidence were a good gift, you should have it. But my experience must not mar your faith in womankind. Keep it as chivalrous as ever, and may God send you the mate whom you deserve. Geoffrey, good night. Good night, Adam and with a handshake more expressive of affection than many a tenderer demonstration, they parted, Warwick to watch the stars for hours, and more to muse beside the fire till the little boots were dry. End of chapter 4《and they went up the river like a party of children on a merry-making. Sylvia decorated herself with garlands till she looked like a mermaid. Mark, as skipper, issued his orders with the true marble-head twang. Moore kept up a fire of pun-provoking raillery. Warwick sung like a jovial giant, while the Kelpie danced over the water as if inspired with the universal gaiety, and the very ripples seemed to laugh as they hurried by. Mark! There is a boat coming up behind us, with three gentlemen in it, who evidently intend to pass us with a great display of skill. Of course you won't let it," said Sylvia, welcoming the prospect of a race. Her brother looked over his shoulder, took a critical survey, and nodded approvingly. "'They are worth a lesson, and shall have it. Easy now till they pass, and then hard all, and give them a specimen of high art.' A sudden lull ensued on board the Kelpie while the blue shirts approached, caught and passed with great display of science, as Sylvia had prophesied, and as good an imitation of demeanour of experienced watermen as could be assumed by a trio of studious youths, not yet out of their teens. 
As the foam of their wake broke against the other boat's side, Mark hailed them. "'Good morning, gentlemen. We'll wait for you above there at the bend.' "'All serene,' returned the rival helmsman, with a bow in honour of Sylvia, while the other two caused a perceptible increase in the speed of the Juanita, whose sentimental name was not at all in keeping with its rakish appearance. "'Short-sighted infants to waste their wind in that style, but they pull well for their years,' observed Mark paternally, as he waited till the others had gained sufficient advantage to make the race a more equal one. "'Now then,' he whispered a moment after, and as if suddenly endowed with life the Kelpie shot away with the smooth speed given by strength and skill. Sylvia watched both boats, yearning to take an oar herself, yet full of admiration for the well-trained rowers, whose swift strokes set the river in a foam, and made the moment one of pleasure and excitement. The blue shirts did their best against competitors who had rowed in many crafts and many waters. They kept the advantage till near the bend. Then Mark's crew lent their reserve strength to a final effort, and bending to their oars with a will, gained steadily, till, with a triumphant stroke, they swept far ahead, and with the oars at rest waited in magnanimous silence till the Juanita came up gracefully confessing her defeat by a good-humoured cheer from her panting crew. For a moment the two boats floated side by side, while the young men interchanged compliments and jokes, for a river is as a highway, where all travellers may salute each other, and college boys are, Hail, fellow, well met, with all the world. Sylvia sat watching the lads, and one among them struck her fancy. The helmsman who had bowed to her was slight and swarthy, with southern eyes, vivacious manners, and a singularly melodious voice. A Spaniard, she thought, and pleased herself with this picturesque figure, till a traitorous smile about the young man's mouth betrayed that he was not unconscious of her regard. She coloured as she met the glance of mingled mirth and admiration that he gave her, and hastily began to pull off the weedy decorations which she had forgotten. But she paused presently, for she heard a surprised voice exclaim, "'Why, Warwick!' Is that you or your ghost? Looking up, Sylvia saw Adam lift the hat he had pulled over his brows, and take a slender brown hand extended over the boat's side with something like reluctance, as he answered the question in Spanish. A short conversation ensued, in which the dark stranger seemed to ask innumerable questions. Warwick, to give curt replies, and the names Gabrielle and Ortilla to occur with familiar frequency. Sylvia knew nothing of the language but received an impression that Warwick was not overjoyed at the meeting, that the youth was both pleased and perplexed by finding him there, and that neither parted with much regret as the distance slowly widened between the boats, and with a farewell salute parted company, each taking a different branch of the river which divided just there. For the first time Warwick allowed Mark to take his place at the oar, and sat looking into the clear depths below, as if some scene lay there which other eyes could not discover. "'Who is that olive-coloured party with the fine eyes and foreign accent?' asked Mark, lazily rowing. "'Gabriel Andre. "'Is he an Italian?' "'No, a Cuban. "'I forgot you'd tried that mixture of Spain and Alabama. "'How was it?' "'As such climates always are to me. "'Intoxicating today, innovating tomorrow. "'How long were you there?' Three months. I feel tropically inclined, so tell us about it. There is nothing to tell. I'll prove that by a catechism. Where did you stay? In Havana. Of course, but with whom? Gabriel Landre. The father of the saffron youth. Yes. Of whom did the family consist? Four persons. Mark, leave Mr. Warwick alone. As long as he answers, I shall question. Name the four persons, Adam. Gabrielle Senior, Dolores his wife, Gabrielle Junior, and Catalina his sister. Ah, now we progress. Was Signorita Catalina as comely as her brother? More so. You adored her, of course. I loved her. Great heavens, what discoveries we make! He likes it, I know, by the satirical glimmer in his eye. Therefore I continue. She adored you, of course. She loved me. You will return and marry her? No. Your depravity appalls me. Did I volunteer its discovery? 
I demand it now. You left this girl believing that you adored her. She knew I was fond of her. The parting was tender, on her part. Iceberg! She wept in your arms, and gave me an orange. You cherished it, of course. I ate it immediately. What want of sentiment! You promised to return? Yes. But we'll never keep the promise. I never break one. Yet we'll not marry her. By no means. Ask how old the lady was, Mark. Age, Warwick. Seven. Mark caught a crab of the largest size at this reply, and remained where he fell among the ruins of his castle in Spain, which he had erected with the scanty materials vouchsafed him, while Warwick went back to his meditations. A drop of rain roused Sylvia from the contemplation of an imaginary portrait of the little Cuban girl, and looking skyward she saw that the frolicsome wind had prepared a practical joke for them in the shape of a thunder shower. A consultation was held, and it was decided to row on till a house appeared, in which they would take refuge till the storm was over. On they went, but the rain was in greater haste than they, and a summary drenching was effected before the toot of a dinner horn guided them to shelter. Landing, they marched over the fields, a moist and mirthful company, towards a red farmhouse standing under venerable elms, with a patriarchal air which promised hospitable treatment and good cheer. A promise speedily fulfilled by the lively old woman, who appeared with an energetic shoo for the speckled hens congregated in the porch, and a hearty welcome for the weather-beaten strangers. "'Sakes alive!' she exclaimed. "'You be in a mess, ain't you? Come right in and make yourselves to home. Abel, take the men-folks up chamber, and fit him out with anything dry he can lay your hands on. Phoebe, see this poor little creature, and bring her down looking less like a drowned kitten. Now to clear up your whittlings, so as they can toast their feet when they come down. And Kinthy, don't dish up dinner just yet. These directions were given with such vigorous illustration, and the old face shone with such friendly zeal, that the four submitted at once, sure that the kind soul was pleasing herself in serving them, and finding something very attractive in the place, the people, and their own position. Abel, a staid farmer of forty, obeyed his mother's order regarding men folks, and Phoebe, a buxom girl of sixteen, led Sylvia to her own room, eagerly offering her best. As she dried and redressed herself, Sylvia made sundry discoveries which added to the romance and the enjoyment of the adventure. A smart gown lay on the bed in the low chamber, also various decorations upon chair and table, suggesting that some festival was afloat, and a few questions elicited the facts. Grandpa had seven sons and three daughters, all living, all married, and all blessed with flocks of children. Grandpa's birthday was always celebrated by a family gathering, but today, being the fiftieth anniversary of his wedding, the various households had resolved to keep it with unusual pomp, and all were coming for a supper, a dance, and a sing at the end. Upon receipt of which intelligence, Sylvia proposed an immediate departure, but the grandmother and daughter cried out at this, pointed to the still falling rain, the lowering sky, the wet heap on the floor and insisted on the strangers all remaining to enjoy the festival, and give an added interest by their presence. Half promising what she wholly desired, Sylvia put on Phoebe's second-best blue gingham gown, for the preservation of which she added a white apron, and completing the whole with a pair of capacious shoes, went down to find her party and reveal the state of affairs. They were bestowed in the prim best parlour, and greeted her with a peal of laughter, for all were en costume. Abel was a stout man, and his garments hung upon Moor with a melancholy air. Mark had disdained them, and with an eye to effect laid hands on an old uniform, in which he looked like a volunteer of 1812, while Warwick's superior height placed Abel's wardrobe out of the question, and Grandpa, taller than any of his seven goodly sons, supplied him with a sober suit, roomy, square-flapped, and venerable, which became him, and with his beard produced the curious effect of a youthful patriarch. To Sylvia's relief, it was unanimously decided to remain, trusting to their own penetration to discover the most agreeable method of returning the favour, and regarding the adventure as a welcome change, after two days' solitude, all went out to dinner prepared to enact their parts with spirit. The meal being dispatched, Mark and Warwick went to help Abel, 
with some outdoor arrangements, and begging Grandma to consider him one of her own boys, Moore tied on an apron and fell to work with Sylvia, laying the long table which was to receive the coming stores. True breeding is often as soon felt by the uncultivated as by the cultivated, and the zeal with which the strangers threw themselves into the business of the hour won the family, and placed them all in friendly relations at once. The old lady let them do what they would, admiring everything, and declaring over and over that her new assistants beat her boys and girls to nothing with their tastiness and smartness. Sylvia trimmed the table with common flowers, till it was an inviting sight before a viand appeared upon it, and hung green boughs about the room, with candles here and there to lend a festal light. Moore trundled great cheese in from the dairy, brought milk pans without mishap, disposed dishes, and caused Nat to cleave to him by the administration of surreptitious titbits and jocular suggestions, for Phoebe tumbled about in every one's way, quite wild with excitement, and Grandma stood in her pantry like a culinary general, swaying a big knife for a baton as she issued orders and marshalled her forces, the busiest and merriest of them all. When the last touch was given, Moore discarded his apron and went to join Mark. Sylvia presided over Phoebe's toilette, and then sat herself down to support Nat through the trying half-hour before, as he expressed it, the party came in. The twelve years boy was a cripple, one of those household blessings which, in the guise of an affliction, keep many hearts tenderly united by a common love and pity. A cheerful creature, always chirping like a cricket on the hearth as he sat carving or turning bits of wood into useful or ornamental shapes, for such as cared to buy them of him, and hoarding up the proceeds like a little miser for one more helpless than himself. "'What are those, Nat?' asked Sylvia, with the interest that always won small people, because their quick instincts felt that it was sincere. "'Them are spoons. Postle spoons, they call em. You see, I've got a cousin what reads a sight, and one day he says to me, Nat, in a book I see something about a set of spoons with a postle head on each of em. You make some, and they'll sell, I bet. So I got Grandpa's Bible and found the pictures of the postles, and worked and worked till I got the faces good. And now it's fine, for they do sell, and I'm saving up a lot. It ain't for me, you know, but Mother, cause she's worse than I be. Is she sick, Nat? Oh, ain't she? When she hasn't stood up this nine year. We were smashed in a wagon that tipped over when I was three years old. It had done something to my legs, but it broke her back and made her no use, only just to pet me and keep us all kind of stiddy, you know. Ain't you seen her? Don't you want to? Would she like it? She admires to see folks, and asked about you at dinner, so I guess you'd better go see her. Looky here, you like them spoons, and I'm a-going to give you one. I'll give you all on em, if it wasn't promised. I can make one more in time, so you just take your pick, cause I like you, and I want you to not to forget me. Sylvia chose St. John, because it resembled more, she thought, bespoke and paid for a whole set, and privately resolved to send tools and rare woods to the little artist that he might serve his mother in his own pretty way. Then Nat took up his crutches, and hopped nimbly before her to the room, where a plain, serene-faced woman lay knitting, with her best cap on, her clean handkerchief, and large green fan laid out upon the coverlet. This was evidently the best room of the house. And as Sylvia sat talking to the invalid, her eye discovered many traces of that refinement which comes through the affections. Nothing seemed too good for daughter patience. Birds, books, flowers, and pictures were plentiful here, though visible nowhere else. Two easy chairs sat beside the bed, showed where the old folks oftenest sat. Abel's home corner was there by the antique desk, covered with farmer's literature and samples of seeds. Phoebe's work basket stood in the window, Nat's lathe in the sunniest corner, and from the speckless carpet to the canary's clear water glass, all was exquisitely neat for love and labour were the handmaids who served the helpless woman, and asked no wages but her comfort. Sylvia amused her new friends mightily, for finding that neither mother nor son had any complaints to make, any sympathy to ask, she exerted herself to give them what both needed, and kept them laughing by a lively recital of her voyage and its mishaps. "'Ain't she prime, mother?' was Nat's candid commentary, when the story ended and he emerged red and shiny from the pillows where he had burrowed with his boyish explosions of delight. "'She's very kind, dear, 
to amuse two stay-at-home folks like you and me, who seldom see what's going on outside four walls. You have a merry heart, miss, and I hope we'll keep it all your days, for it's a blessed thing to own. I think you have something better, a contented one, said Sylvia, as the woman regarded her with no sign of envy or regret. I ought to have. Nine years on a body's back can teach a sight of things that are worth knowing. I've learnt patience pretty well, I guess, and contentedness ain't far away. For though it sometimes seems rather long to look forward to, perhaps nine more years laying here, I just remember it might have been worse. And if I don't do much now, there's all eternity to come. Something in the woman's manner struck Sylvia as she watched her softly beating some tune on the sheet, with her quiet eyes turned toward the light. Many sermons had been less eloquent to the girl than the look, the tone, the cheerful resignation of that plain face. She stooped and kissed it, saying gently, "'I shall remember this.' "'Hooray! There they be! I hear Ben!' And away clattered Nat, to be immediately absorbed into the embrace of a swarm of relatives, who now began to arrive in a steady stream. Old and young, large and small, rich and poor, with overflowing hands or trifles humbly given, all were received alike, all hugged by Grandpa, kissed by Grandma, shaken half breathless by Uncle Abel, welcomed by Aunt Patience, and danced round by Phoebe and Nat till the house seemed a great hive of hilarious and affectionate bees. At first the strangers stood apart, but Phoebe spread their story with such complimentary additions of her own that the family circle opened wide and took them in at once. Sylvia was enraptured with the wilderness of babies and leaving the others to their own devices, followed the matrons to Patience's room, and gave herself up to the pleasant tyranny of the small potentates, who swarmed over her as she sat on the floor, tugging at her hair, exploring her eyes, covering her with moist kisses, and keeping up a babble of little voices more delightful to her than the discourse of the flattered mammas who benignly surveyed her admiration and their offspring's prowess. The young people went to romp in the barn, the men, armed with umbrellas, turned out en masse to inspect the farm and stock, and compare notes over pig-pens and garden gates. But Sylvia lingered where she was, enjoying a scene which filled her with a tender pain and pleasure, for each baby was laid on Grandma's knee, its small virtues, vices, ailments and accomplishments rehearsed, its beauties examined, its strength tested, and the verdict of the family oracle pronounced upon it as it was cradled, kissed, and blessed on the kind old heart which had room for every care and joy of those who never called her mother. It was a sight the girl never forgot, because just then she was ready to receive it. Her best lessons did not come from books, and she had learned one then as she saw the fairest success of a woman's life, while watching this happy grandmother with fresh faces framing her withered one, daughterly voices chorusing good wishes, and the harvest of half a century of wedded life beautifully garnered in her arms. The fragrance of coffee and recollections of Cynthia's joyful aberrations at such periods caused a breaking up of the maternal conclave. The babies were borne away to simmer between blankets until called for. The women unpacked baskets, brooded over teapots, and kept up a harmonious clack as the table was spread with pyramids of cake, regiments of pies, quagmires of jelly, snowbanks of bread, and gold mines of butter. Every possible article of food, from baked beans to wedding cake, finding a place on that sacrificial altar. Fearing to be in the way, Sylvia departed to the barn, where she found her party in a chaotic babel. For the offshoots had been as fruitful as the parent tree, and some four dozen young immortals were in full riot, the bashful roosting with the hens on remote lofts and beams, the bold flirting or playing in the full light of day, the boys whooping, the girls screaming, all effervescing as if their spirits had reached the explosive point and must find vent in noise. Mark was in his element, introducing all manner of new games, the liveliest of the old, and keeping the revel at its height. For rosy, bright-eyed girls were plenty, and the ancient uniform universally approved. Warwick had a flock of lads about him, absorbed in the marvels he was producing with knife, stick, and string. And more, a rival flock of little lasses breathless with interest in the tales he told, one on each knee, two at each side, four in a row on the hay at his feet, and the boldest of all with an arm about his neck and a curly head upon his shoulder, for Uncle Abel's clothes seemed to invest the wearer with a passport to their confidence at once. 
Sylvia joined this group and partook of quiet entertainment, with as childlike a relish as any of them, while the merry tumult went on about her. The toot of the horn sent the whole barnful streaming into the house like a flock of hungry chickens, where, by some process known only to the mothers of large families, every one was wedged close about the table, and the feast began. This was none of your stand-up wafery bread and butter teas, but a thorough-going, sit-down supper, and all settled themselves with smiling satisfaction, prophetic of great powers and an equal willingness to employ them. A detachment of half-grown girls was drawn up behind Grandma as waiters. Sylvia insisted on being one of them, and proved herself a neat-handed Phyllis, though for a time slightly bewildered by the gastronomic performances she beheld. Babies ate pickles, small boys sequestered pie with a velocity that made her wink. Women swam in the tea, and the men, metaphorically speaking, swept over the table like a swarm of locusts, while the host and hostess beamed upon one another, and their robust descendants with an honest pride, which was beautiful to see. "'That Mr. Wackett ain't eat scarcely nothing. He just sit looking round kind of me's like. Do go and make him fall on to something, or I shan't take a mite of comfort in my vittles,' said Grandma, as the girl came with an empty cup. "'He is enjoying it with all his heart and eyes, ma'am, for we don't see such fine spectacles every day.' I'll take him something that he likes and make him eat it. Sakes alive! Be you to be Miss Wackett. I'd no idea of it. You look so young. Nor I. We are only friends, ma'am. Oh! And the monosyllable was immensely expressive, as the old lady confided a knowing nod to the teapot, into whose depths she was just then peering. Sylvia walked away, wondering why persons were always thinking and saying such things. As she paused behind Warwick's chair with a glass of cream and a round of brown bread, he looked up at her with his blandest expression, though a touch of something like regret was in his voice. "'This is a sight worth living eighty hard years to see, and I envy that old couple as I never envied any one before, to rear ten virtuous children, put ten useful men and women into the world, and give them health and courage to work out their own salvation as these honest souls will do.' is a better job done for the Lord than winning a battle or ruling a state. Here is all honour to them. Drink it with me. He put the glass to her lips, drank what she left, and rising, placed her in his seat with a decisive air which few resisted. You take no thought for yourself, and are doing too much. Sit here a little, and let me take a few steps where you have taken many. He served her, and standing at her back, bent now and then to speak, still with that softened look upon the face so seldom stirred by the gentler emotions that lay far down in the deep heart of his, for never had he felt so solitary. All things must have an end, even a family feast, and by the time the last boys buttoned peremptorily announced, Thus far shalt thou go, and no further, all professed themselves satisfied, and a general uprising took place. The surplus population were herded into parlour and chambers, while a few energetic hands cleared away, and with much clattering of dishes and wafting of towels, left Grandma's spandy clean premises as immaculate as ever. It was dark when all was done, so the kitchen was cleared, the candles lighted, Patience's door set open, and little Nat established in an impromptu orchestra composed of a table and a chair, whence the first squeak of his fiddle proclaimed that the ball had begun. Everybody danced. The babies stacked on Patience's bed or penned behind chairs, sprawled and pranced in unsteady mimicry of their elders. Ungainly farmers, stiff with labour, recalled their early days and tramped briskly as they swung their wives about with a kindly pressure of the hard hands that had worked so long together. Little pairs toddled gravely through the figures, or frisked promiscuously in a grand conglomeration of arms and legs. Gallant cousins kissed pretty cousins at exciting periods, and were not rebuked. Mark wrought several of these incipient lovers to a pitch of despair by his devotion to the comeliest damsels, and the skill with which he executed unheard-of evolutions before their admiring eyes. More let out the poorest and the plainest with a respect that caused their homely faces to shine, and their scant skirts to be forgotten. Warwick skimmed his five years' partner through the air in a way that rendered her speechless with delight, and Sylvia danced as she never danced before the sticky-fingered boys, sleepy with repletion, but bound to last it out, with rough-faced men who paid her paternal compliments, with smart youths who turned sheepish, 
with that white lady's hand in their big brown ones. And one ambitious lad who confided to her his burning desire to work a sawmill and marry a girl with black eyes and yellow hair. While perched aloft, Nat bowed away till his pale face glowed, till all hearts warmed, all feet beat responsive to the good old tunes which have put so much health into human bodies and so much happiness into human souls. At the stroke of nine, the last dance came. All down the long kitchen stretched two breathless rows, Grandpa and Grandma at the top, the youngest pair of grandchildren at the bottom, and all between fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts and cousins, while such of the babies as were still extant bobbed with unabated vigour. As Nat struck up the Virginia reel, and the sturdy old couple led off as gallantly as the young ones who came tearing up to meet them, away they went, Grandpa's white hair flying in the wind, Grandma's impressive cap awry with excitement, as they ambled down the middle and finished with a kiss when their tuneful journey was done, amid immense applause from those who regarded this as the crowning event of the day. When all had had their turn, and twirled till they were dizzy, a short lull took place with the refreshments for such as still possessed the power of enjoying them. Then Phoebe appeared with an armful of books, and all settled themselves for the family sing. Sylvia had heard much fine music, but never any that touched her like this, for, though often discordant, it was hearty with that undercurrent of feeling which adds sweetness to the rudest lay, and is often more attractive than the most florid ornament or faultless execution. Everyone sang as everyone had danced, with all their might, shrill children, soft-voiced girls, lullaby-singing mothers, gruff boys and strong-lunged men. The old pair quavered, and still a few indefatigable babies crowed behind their little coops. Songs, ballads, comic airs, popular melodies and hymns came in rapid succession, and when they ended with that song which should be classed with sacred music, for association's sake, and standing hand in hand about the room with the golden bride and bridegroom in their midst, sang Home. Sylvia leaned against her brother with dim eyes and a heart too full to sing. Still standing thus when the last note had soared up and died, the old man folded his hands and began to pray. It was an old-fashioned prayer, such as the girl had never heard from the bishop's lips, ungrammatical, inelegant, and long. A quiet talk with God, manly in its straightforward confession of shortcomings, childlike in its appeal for guidance, fervent in its gratitude for all good gifts, and the crowning one of loving children. As if close intercourse had made the two familiar, this human father turned to the divine, as these sons and daughters turned to him, as free to ask, as confident of a reply, as all afflictions, blessings, cares and crosses were laid down before him, and the work of eighty years submitted to his hand. There were no sounds in the room, but the one voice, often tremulous with emotion and with age, the coo of some dreaming baby, or the low sob of some mother whose arms were empty as the old man stood there, rugged and white atop as the granite hills, with the old wife at his side, a circle of sons and daughters girdling them round, and in all hearts the thought that as the former wedding had been made for time, this golden one at eighty must be for eternity. While Sylvia looked and listened, a sense of genuine devotion stole over her. The beauty and the worth of prayer grew clear to her though the earnest speech of that unlettered man, and for the first time she fully felt the nearness and the dreariness of the universal father, whom she had been taught to fear, yet longed to love. "'Now, my children, you must go before the little folks are tuckered out,' said Grandpa heartily. "'Mother and me can't say enough to thank you for the presents you've fetched us, the dutiful wishes you have given us, the pride and comfort you have always been to us. I ain't no hand at speeches.' So I shan't make none, but just say, if any affliction falls on any of you, remember mother's here, to help you bear it. If any worldly loss comes to you, remember your father's house is your where it stands, and so the Lord bless and keep us all. Three cheers for Grandpa and Grandma, roared a six-foot scion at a safety valve, sundry unmasculine emotions, and three rousing hurrahs made the rafters ring struck terror into the heart of the oldest inhabitant of the rat-haunted garret, and summarily woke all the babies. Then the goodbyes began, the flurry of wrong baskets, pails and bundles in wrong places, 
the sorting out of small folk too sleepy to know or care what became of them, the maternal cluckings and paternal shouts for Kitty, Sai, Ben, Bill or Mary Ann, the piling into vehicles with much ramping of indignant horses unused to such late hours, the last farewells, the roll of wheels as one by one the happy loads departed, and peace fell upon the household for another year. I declare for it, I never had sitch an out and out good time since I was born into the world. Abram, you're fit to drop, and so be I. Now let's sit and talk it over of patience fore we go to bed. The old couple got into their chairs, and as they sat there side by side, remembering that she had given no gift, Sylvia crept behind them, and lending the magic of her voice to the simple air, sang the fittest song for time and place. John Anderson, my Jo. It was too much for Grandma. The old heart overflowed, and the reckless of the cherished cap she laid on her head on her John's shoulder, exclaiming through her tears, That's the cap sheaf of the hull, and I can't bear no more tonight. Abram, lend me a handkerchief, for I don't know where mine is, and my face is all of a trip. Before the red bandana had gently performed its work in Grandpa's hand, Sylvia beckoned her party from the room, and showed them the clear moonlit night which followed the storm suggested that they should both save appearances, and enjoy a novel pleasure by floating homeward instead of sleeping. The tide against which they had pulled in coming up would sweep them rapidly along, and make it easy to retrace in a few hours the way they had loitered over for three days. The pleasant excitement of the evening had not yet subsided, and all applauded the plan as fit finale to their voyage. The old lady strongly objected, but the young people overruled her, and being re-equipped in their damaged garments, they bade the friendly family a grateful adieu, left their more solid thanks under Nat's pillow, and re-embarked upon their shining road. All night Sylvia lay under the canopy of boughs her brother made to shield her from the dew, listening to the soft sounds about her, the twitter of a restless bird, the bleat of some belated lamb, the ripple of a brook babbling like a baby in its sleep. All night she watched the changing shores, silvery green or dark with a slumberous shadow and followed the moon in its tranquil journey through the sky. When it set, she drew her cloak about her, and pillowing her head upon her arm, exchanged the waking for a sleeping dream. A thick mist encompassed her when she awoke. Above the sun shone dimly, below rose and fell the billows of the sea, before her sounded the city's fitful hum, and far behind her lay the green wilderness, where she had lived and learned so much. Slowly the fog lifted, the sun came dazzling down upon the sea, and out into the open bay they sailed, with the pennon streaming in the morning wind. But still, with backward glance, the girl watched the misty wall that rose between her and the charmed river, and still with yearning heart confessed how sweet that brief experience had been, for though she had not yet discovered it like the fairy lady of Shalott, she had left the web and left the loom, had seen the water lilies bloom had seen the helmet and the plume, and had looked down to Camelot. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Jenny Wildman Chapter 6 of Moods This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kathleen Moods by Louisa May Alcott Chapter Six Why Sylvia Was Happy I never did understand you, Sylvia, and this last month you have been a perfect enigma to me, with rocking chair in full action, suspended needle and thoughtful expression. Miss Yule had watched her sister for ten minutes as she sat with her work at her feet, her hands folded on her lap, and her eyes dreamily fixed on vacancy. I always was to myself, Prue, and am more so than ever now, answered Sylvia, waking out of her reverie with a smile that proved it had been a pleasant one. There must be some reason for this great change in you. Come, tell me, dear. With a motherly gesture, Miss Yule drew the girl to her knee, brushed back the bright hair, and looked into the face so freely turned to hers. Through all the years they had been together, the elder sister had never seen before the expression which the younger's face now wore. A vague expectancy sat in her eyes. 
some nameless content sweetened her smile a beautiful repose replaced the varying enthusiasm listlessness and melancholy that used to haunt her countenance and make it such a study miss yule could not read the secret of the change yet felt its novel charm sylvia could not explain it though penetrated by its power and for a moment the sisters looked into each other's faces wondering why each seemed altered then prue who never wasted much time in speculations of any kind shook her head and repeated i don't understand it but it must be right because you are so improved in every way ever since that wild trip up the river you have been growing quiet lovable and cheerful and i really begin to hope that you will become like other people i only know that i am happy prue why it is so i cannot tell but now i seldom have the old dissatisfied and restless feeling everything looks pleasant to me every one seems kind and life begins to be both sweet and earnest it is only one of my moods i suppose but i am grateful for it and pray that it may last so earnestly she spoke so cheerfully she smiled that miss Ewell blessed the mood and echoed sylvia's wish exclaiming in the next breath with a sudden inspiration my dear i've got it you are growing up i think i am you tried to make a woman of me at sixteen but it was impossible until the right time came that wild trip up the river as you call it did more for me than i can ever tell and when i seem most like a child i was learning to be a woman well my dear go on as you've begun and i shall be more than satisfied what merry-making is on foot to-night mark and these friends of his keep you in constant motion with their riding rowing and rambling excursions and if i did not agree with you so excellently i really should like a little quiet after a month of bustle they are only coming up as usual and that reminds me that i must go and dress there is another new change sylvia you never used to care what you wore or how you looked no matter how much time and trouble i expended on you and your wardrobe now you do care and it does my heart good to see you always charmingly dressed and looking your prettiest said miss yule with the satisfaction of a woman who heartily believed in costume as well as all the other elegances and proprieties of fashionable life am i ever that prue asked sylvia pausing on the threshold with a shy yet wistful glance ever what dear pretty always so to me and now i think every one finds you very attractive because you try to please and seem to succeed delightfully sylvia had never asked that question before had never seemed to know or care and could not have chosen a more auspicious moment for her frank inquiry than the present the answer seemed to satisfy her and smiling at some blithe anticipation of her own she went away to make a lampless toilet in the dusk which proved how slight a hold the feminine passion for making one's self pretty had yet taken upon her the september moon was up and shining clearly over garden lawn and sea when the sound of voices called her down at the stair foot she paused with a disappointed air for only one hat lay on the hall table and a glance showed her only one guest with mark and prue she strolled irresolutely through the breezy hall looked out at either open door sung a little to herself but broke off in the middle of a line and as if following a sudden impulse went out into the mellow moonlight forgetful of uncovered head or dewy damage to the white hem of her gown halfway down the avenue she paused before a shady nook and looked in the evergreens that enclosed it made the seat doubly dark to eyes inured to the outer light and seeing a familiar seeming figure sitting with its head upon its hand sylvia leaned in saying with a daughterly caress why what is my romantic father doing here the sense of touch was quicker than that of sight 
and with an exclamation of surprise she had drawn back before warwick replied it is not the old man but the young one who is romancing here i beg your pardon we have been waiting for you what thought is so charming that you forgot us all sylvia was a little startled else she would scarcely have asked so plain a question but warwick often asked much blunter ones always told the naked truth without prevarication or delay and straightway answered the thought of the woman whom i hope to make my wife sylvia stood silent for a moment as if intent on fastening in her hair the delicate spray of hop bells just gathered from the vine that formed a leafy frame for the graceful picture which she made standing with uplifted arms behind the arch when she spoke it was to say as she moved on toward the house it is too beautiful a night to stay indoors but prue is waiting for me and mark wants to plan with you about our ride to-morrow shall we go together she beckoned and he came out of the shadow showing her an expression which she had never seen before his face was flushed his eye unquiet his manner eager yet restrained she had seen him intellectually excited many times never emotionally till now something wayward yet warm in this new mood attracted her because so like her own but with a tact as native as her sympathy she showed no sign of this except in the attentive look she fixed upon him as the moonlight bathed him in its splendor he met the glance seemed to interpret it aright but did not answer its unconscious inquiry for pausing he asked abruptly should a rash promise be considered binding when it threatens to destroy one's peace sylvia pondered an instant before she answered slowly if the promise was freely given no sin committed in its keeping and no peace troubled but one's own i should say yes still pausing he looked down at her with that unquiet glance as she looked up with her steady one and with the same anxiety he asked would you keep such a promise inviolate even though it might cost you the sacrifice of something dearer to you than your life she thought again and again looked up answering with the sincerity that he had taught her it might be unwise but if the sacrifice was not one of principle or something that i ought to love more than life i think i should keep the promise as religiously as an indian keeps a vow of vengeance as she spoke some recollection seemed to strike warwick like a sudden stab the flush died out of his face the fire from his eyes and an almost grim composure fell upon him as he said low to himself with a forward step as if eager to leave some pain behind him it is better so for his sake i will leave all to time sylvia saw his lips move but caught no sound till he said with a gravity that was almost gloom i think you would therefore beware how you bind yourself with such verbal bonds let us go in they went warwick to the drawing-room but sylvia ran up stairs for the berlin wools which in spite of heat and the sure staining of fingers were to be wound that night according to contract for she kept a small promise as sacredly as she would have done a greater one what have you been doing to give yourself such an uplifted expression sylvia said mark as she came in feasting my eyes on lovely colors does not that look like a folded rainbow she answered laying her brilliant burden on the table where warwick sat examining a broken reel and prue was absorbed in getting a carriage blanket under way come sylvia i shall soon be ready for the first shade she said clashing her formidable needles is that past mending mr warwick yes without better tools than a knife two pins and a bodkin then you must put the skeins on a chair sylvia try not to tangle them and spread your handkerchief in your lap for that maroon colour will stain sadly now don't speak to me for i must count my stitches sylvia began to wind the wools with a swift dexterity as natural to her hands as certain little graces of gesture which made their motions pleasant to watch warwick never rummaged work-baskets gossiped 
or paid compliments for want of something to do if no little task appeared for them he kept his hands out of mischief and if nothing occurred to make words agreeable or necessary he proved that he understood the art of silence and sat with those vigilant eyes of his fixed upon whatever object attracted them just then the object was a bright band slipping round the chair back with a rapidity that soon produced a snarl but no help till patient fingers had smoothed and wound it up then with the look of one who says to himself i will he turned planted himself squarely before sylvia and held out his hands here is a reel that will neither tangle nor break your skeins will you use it yes thank you and in return i'll wind your color first which is my color this fine scarlet strong enduring and martial like yourself you are right i thought so mr moore prefers blue and i violet blue and red make violet called mark from his corner catching the word color though busy with a sketch for a certain fair jesse hope moore was with mr yule in his study prue mentally wrapped in her blanket and when sylvia was drawn into an artistic controversy with her brother warwick fell into deep thought with the pride of a proud man once deceived he had barred his heart against womankind resolving that no second defeat should oppress him with that distrust of self and others which is harder for a generous nature to bear than the pain of its own wound he had yet to learn that the shadow of love suggests its light and that they who have been cheated of the food without which none can truly live long for it with redoubled hunger of late he had been discovering this for a craving stronger than his own strong will possessed him he tried to disbelieve and silence it attacked it with reason starved it with neglect and chilled it with contempt but when he fancied it was dead the longing rose again and with a clamorous cry undid his work for the first time this free spirit felt the master's hand confessed a need its own power could not supply and saw that no man can live alone on even the highest aspirations without suffering for the vital warmth of the affections a month ago he would have disdained the hope that now was so dear to him but imperceptibly the influence of domestic life had tamed and won him solitude looked barren vagrancy had lost its charm his life seemed cold and bare for though devoted to noble aims it was wanting in the social sacrifices cares and joys that foster charity and sweeten character and impetuous desire to enjoy the rich experience which did so much for others came over him to-night as it had often done while sharing the delights of this home where he had made so long a pause but with the desire came a memory that restrained him better than his promise he saw what others had not yet discovered and obeying the code of honor which governs a true gentleman loved his friend better than himself and held his peace the last gain came and as she wound it sylvia's glance involuntarily rose from the strong hands to the face above them and lingered there for the penetrating gaze was averted and an unwonted mildness inspired confidence as its usual expression of power commanded respect his silence troubled her and with curious yet respectful scrutiny she studied his face as she had never done before she found it full of a noble gravity and kindliness candor and courage spoke in the lines of the mouth benevolence and intellect in the broad arch of the forehead ardor and energy in the fire of the eye and on every lineament the stamp of that genuine manhood which no art can counterfeit intent upon discovering the secret of the mastery he exerted over all who approached him sylvia had quite forgotten herself when suddenly warwick's eyes were fixed full upon her own what spell lay in them she could not tell for human eye had never shed such sudden summer over her admiration was not in it for it did not agitate nor audacity for it did not abash but something that thrilled warm through blood and nerves that filled her with a glad submission to some power absolute yet tender 
and caused her to turn her innocent face freely to his gaze letting him read therein a sentiment for which she had not yet found a name it lasted but a moment yet in that moment each saw the other's heart and each turned a new page in the romance of their lives sylvia's eyes fell first but no blush followed no sign of anger or perplexity only a thoughtful silence which continued till the last violet thread dropped from his hands and she said almost regretfully this is the end yes this is the end as he echoed the words warwick rose suddenly and went to talk with mark whose sketch was done sylvia sat a moment as if quite forgetful where she was so absorbing was some thought or emotion presently she seemed to glow and kindle with an inward fire over face and forehead rushed an impetuous colour her eyes shone and her lips trembled with the fluttering of her breath then a panic appeared to seize her for stealing noiselessly away she hurried to her room and covering up her face as if to hide it even from herself whispered to that full heart of hers with quick coming tears that belied the words now i know why i am happy how long she lay there weeping and smiling in the moonlight she never knew her sister's call broke in upon the first love dream she had ever woven for herself and she went down to bid the friends good-night the hall was only lighted by the moon and in the dimness of the shadow where she stood no one saw traces of that midsummer shower on her cheeks or detected the soft trouble in her eye but for the first time moore felt her hand tremble in his own and welcomed the propitious omen being an old-fashioned gentleman mr yule preserved in his family the pleasant custom of handshaking which gives such heartiness to the morning and evening greetings of a household moore liked and adopted it warwick had never done so but that night he gave a hand to prue and mark with his most cordial expression and sylvia felt both her own taken in a warm lingering grasp although he only said good-bye then they went but while the three paused at the door held by the beauty of the night back to them on the wings of the wind came warwick's voice singing the song that sylvia loved all down the avenue and far along the winding road they traced his progress till the strain died in the distance leaving only the echo of the song to link them to the singer when evening came again sylvia waited on the lawn to have the meeting over in the dark for love made her very shy but moore came alone and his first words were comfort me sylvia adam is gone he went as unexpectedly as he came and when i woke this morning a note lay at my door but my friend was not there she murmured some stereotyped regret but there was a sharp pain at her heart till there came to her the remembrance of warwick's question uttered on the spot where she was standing some solace she must have and clinging to this one thought hopefully within herself he has made some promise has gone to get released from it and will come back to say what he looked last night he is so true i will believe in him and wait she did wait but week after week went by and warwick did not come end of chapter six chapter seven of moods this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox dot org recording by kathleen moods by louisa may alcott chapter seven dull but necessary whoever cares only for incident and action in a book had better skip this chapter and read on but those who take an interest in the delineation of character will find the key to sylvia's here john yule might have been a poet painter or a philanthropist for heaven had endowed him with fine gifts he was a prosperous merchant with no ambition but to leave a fortune to his children and live down the memory of a bitter past on the threshold of his life he stumbled and fell for as he paused there waiting for the first step to appear providence tested and found him wanting on one side poverty offered the aspiring youth her meagre hand 
but he was not wise enough to see the virtues hidden under her hard aspect nor brave enough to learn the stern yet salutary lessons which labor necessity and patience teach giving to those who serve and suffer the true success on the other hand opulence allured him with her many baits and silencing the voice of conscience he yielded to temptation and wrecked his nobler self a loveless marriage was the price he paid for his ambition not a costly one he thought till time taught him that whosoever mars the integrity of his own soul by transgressing the great laws of life even by so much as a hair's breadth entails upon himself and heirs the inevitable retribution which proves their worth and keeps them sacred the tide that bound and burdened the unhappy twain worn then by constant friction snapped at last and in the solemn pause death made in his busy life there rose before him those two ghosts who sooner or later haunt us all saying with reproachful voices this i might have been and this i am then he saw the failure of his life at fifty he found himself poorer than when he made his momentous choice for the years that had given him wealth position children had also taken from him youth self-respect and many a gift whose worth was magnified by loss he endeavored to repair the fault so tardily acknowledged but found it impossible to cancel it when remorse embittered effort and age left him powerless to redeem the rich inheritance squandered in his prime if ever man received punishment for a self-inflicted wrong it was john ewell a punishment as subtle as the sin for in the children growing up about him every relinquished hope neglected gift lost aspiration seemed to live again yet on each and all was set the dire full stamp of imperfection which made them visible illustrations of the great law broken in his youth in prudence as she grew to womanhood he saw his own practical tact and talent nothing more she seemed the living representative of the years spent in strife for profit power and place the petty cares that fret the soul the mercenary schemes that waste a life the worldly formalities frivolities and fears that so belittle character all these he saw in his daughter's shape and with pathetic patience bore the daily trial of an over-active over-anxious affectionate but most prosaic child in mark he saw his ardor for the beautiful his love of the poetic his reverence for genius virtue heroism but here too the subtle blight had fallen this son though strong in purpose was feeble in performance for some hidden spring of power was wanting and the shadow of that earlier defeat chilled in his nature the energy which is the first attribute of all success mark loved poetry and wrote in numbers for the numbers came but whether tragic tender or devout in each attempt there was enough of the divine fire to warm them into life yet not enough to gift them with the fervor that can make a line immortal and every song was a sweet lament for the loftier lays that might have been he loved art and gave himself to it but though studying all forms of beauty he never reached its soul and every effort tantalized him with fresh glimpses of the fair ideal which he could not reach he loved the true but high thoughts seldom blossomed into noble deeds for when the hour came the man was never ready and disappointment was his daily portion a sad fate for the son a far sadder one for the father who had bequeathed it to him from the irrecoverable past in sylvia he saw mysteriously blended the two natures that had given her life although she was born when the gulf between regretful husband and sad wife was widest as if indignant nature rebelled against the outrage done in her holiest ties adverse temperaments gifted the child with the good and ill of each from her father she received pride intellect and will from her mother passion imagination and the fateful melancholy of a woman defrauded of her dearest hope 
these conflicting temperaments with all their aspirations attributes and inconsistencies were woven into a nature fair and faulty ambitious yet not self-reliant sensitive yet not keen-sighted these two masters ruled soul and body warring against each other making sylvia an enigma to herself and her life a train of moods a wise and tender mother would have divined her nameless deeds answered her vague desires and through the medium of the most omnipotent affection given to humanity have made her what she might have been but sylvia had never known mother love for her life came through death and the only legacy bequeathed her was a slight hold upon existence a ceaseless craving for affection and the shadow of a tragedy that wrung from the pale lips that grew cold against her baby cheek the cry free at last thank god for that prudence could not fill the empty place though the good-hearted housewife did her best neither sister understood the other and each tormented the other through her very love prue unconsciously exasperated sylvia sylvia unconsciously shocked prue and they hitched along together each trying to do well and each taking diametrically opposite measures to effect her purpose mark briefly but truly described them when he said sylvia trims the house with flowers but prudence dogs her with a dustpan mr yule was now a studious melancholy man who having said one fatal no to himself made it the satisfaction of his life to say a never varying yes to his children but though he left no wish of theirs ungratified he seemed to have forfeited his power to draw and hold them to himself he was more like an unobtrusive guest than a master in his house his children loved but never clung to him because unseen yet impassable rose the barrier of an instinctive protest against the wrong done their dead mother unconscious on their part but terribly significant to him mark had been years away and though the brother and sister were tenderly attached sex tastes and pursuits kept them too far apart and sylvia was solitary even in this social seeming home dissatisfied with herself she endeavored to make her life what it should be with the energy of an ardent aspiring nature and through all experiences sweet or bitter all varying moods successes and defeats a sincere desire for happiness the best and highest was the little rushlight of her soul that never wavered or went out she never had known friendship in its truest sense for next to love it is the most abused of words she had called many friend but was still ignorant of that sentiment cooler than passion warmer than respect more just and generous than either which recognizes a kindred spirit in another and claiming its right keeps it sacred by the wise reserve that is to friendship what the purple bloom is to the grape a charm which once destroyed can never be restored love she had desired yet dreaded knowing her own passionate nature and when it came to her making that brief holiday the fateful point of her life she gave herself to it wholly before that time she had rejoiced over a more tranquil pleasure and believed that she had found her friend in the neighbor who after long absence had returned to his old place nature had done much for geoffrey moore but the wise mother also gave him those teachers to whose hard lessons she often leaves her dearest children five years spent in the service of a sister who through the sharp discipline of pain was fitting her meek soul for heaven had given him an experience such as few young men receive this fraternal devotion proved a blessing in disguise it preserved him from any profanation of his youth and the companionship of the helpless creature whom he loved had proved an ever-present stimulant to all that was best and sweetest in the man a single duty faithfully performed had set the seal of integrity upon his character and given him grace to see at thirty the rich compensation he had received for the ambition silently sacrificed at twenty-five when his long vigil was over he looked into the world to find his place again but the old desires were dead the old allurements had lost their charm 
and while he waited for time to show him what good work he should espouse no longing was so strong as that for a home where he might bless and be blessed in writing that immortal poem a virtuous and happy life sylvia soon felt the power and beauty of this nature and remembering how well he had ministered to a physical affliction often looked into the face whose serenity was a perpetual rebuke longing to ask him to help and heal the mental ills that perplexed and burdened her more soon divined the real isolation of the girl read the language of her wistful eyes felt that he could serve her and invited confidence by the cordial alacrity with which he met her least advance but while he served he learned to love her for sylvia humble in her own conceit and guarded by the secret passion that possessed her freely showed the regard she felt with no thought of misapprehension no fear of consequences unconscious that such impulsive demonstration made her only more attractive that every manifestation of her frank esteem was cherished in her friend's heart of hearts and that through her he was enjoying the blossom time of life so peacefully and pleasantly the summer ripened into autumn and sylvia's interest into an enduring friendship End of chapter seven